Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, participants at the TG Live um, this year in March 2022. Uh, my name is Anna Felt. I'm the Global Head of the Women's Empowerment Principal Secretariat at UN Women, based in, in New York. Um, so welcome to this live session on how we are ensuring flexibility during the pandemic and beyond. Some of you may ask yourself, flexibility of what or for whom? Uh, we'll go deeper into these questions during this session. And we have two amazing experts with us today who would help us to answer these questions. Renee Connolly, Chief DEI Officer at Merck Germany and Agnieszka lechmann Filipiak, Filipiak, a partner at DLA Piper in Poland. However, before I ask them to join the conversation, let me highlight a few observations that I've had over the past two years. One, the pandemic has exposed cracks in social, political, and economic systems. COVID-19 has exposed structural inequalities that have always been in place. Even the most advanced and best resourced nations have been strained by this pandemic. Let me highlight two specific issues that should be of our highest concern. The first one is domestic violence. And at UN Women, we also call it the shadow pandemic because it is part of the pandemic that is in the shadow of the bigger health issues, even though it, it's a very important issue. As victims of domestic violence, women were locked down with their abusers. Domestic violence is about power and control. And with the added stress, tension, and financial insecurities emanating from the pandemic, in many cases, it exacerbated the existing abuse, or in some cases, it occurred for the first time. The demand for violence response services increased to up to 500% in some countries. So we are talking about extraordinary numbers. And we need to keep this very important issue in mind as we discuss flexibility at work. Because working from home doesn't equal working in a safe environment. So as employers, please keep this in mind and, and uh, put in place measures that address this very, very serious issue. The second issue that I wanted to, to pinpoint today is care responsibilities. And as unpaid caregivers in families and communities, women have stepped up to compensate for closure of schools, closure of, of other um, child care and elder care uh, facilities, um, which has further increased the care burden. There was already a triple of that of men. Uh, in 2020, uh, about 64 million women dropped out of the labor market partially to take care of their families, children, the sick, and the elderly. This should be causing alarms for companies, not only because of the high attrition rates <clears throat> that have high cost to organizations, but research shows that women's equal participation from the factory floor to the corporate boards lead to better financial performance, raises return on investment, fosters diverse ideas and generate dynamics that encourage creativity and leads to innovation, attracts investment as investors are increasingly aware that gender responsive companies are more productive, less risky and maintain a positive rep reputation. It attracts and retains talent and better meets the needs and demands of consumers. Many of our web signatories have taken action to facilitate work-life balance um, we have from the um, web's gender gap analysis tool, some data that 54% are offering telecommuting. But that to say telecommuting is not for all business and for all sectors, um, but it is an indication that this is increasing. However, 5% provide on-site childcare and referrals for off-site childcare compared to 18% in 2020. So we are on the decline on that, and, and we need to take these issues very seriously. So today we have two web signatories with us, uh, Merck, uh, represented by Renee Connolly, 
Chief VI Officer and um, DLA uh, Piper, represented by Agnieszka lechman Filipiak. So I'm, I'm very curious to learn more about the, the work that you are doing to facilitate uh, work-life balance and flexibility at work. So um, I'll start with uh, Renee to just give you, if you could give us a little bit of an idea, maybe just introduce you briefly and then just give us an idea on how workplace flexibility play a role in your organization and how is your organization supporting remote working at scale? Thank you so much for the um, comments, Anna. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm super excited to represent. I'm gonna just correct a little bit. It's, so our organization, I'm the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer for Merck, KGAA Darmstadt, Germany, headquartered out of Darmstadt, Germany for a company that's over 350 years old and uh, have the good pleasure to do that. Um, to your question, you know, I would, I would say that like many companies, we have built a new muscle as it relates to uh, being flexible, uh, to being accommodating, to being empathetic, to um, having understanding of what it's going to take to motivate our workforce in a time where the blurred lines between home and work seem to get closer and closer together. And I don't see them coming apart too much yet, not that quickly. You know, we're still seeing a real convergence. Um, I think there are two things that I have observed, at least with our organization, because of what Merck KGA Darmstadt Germany does, we have been extremely um, resilient in the fact that a majority of our workforce had to stay working in the plants, manufacturing equipment and tools necessary in the fight against COVID, whether or not it was single use assemblies, lateral flow membranes, lots of different things. So our business demanded it. Our employees who weren't required to be in the office, we kind of took an approach that allowed us to keep a bubble safe of our manufacturing workers so that we can ensure business continuity. We had principles around business continuity, employee safety first, of course, continuity, and then sort of the well being of our employees, families, and external universe, and how do we support them? So I think we always struck a balance between what it's going to require. I think in an organization like ourselves, it was also critical that we do not. Um, create an environment where it's the haves. So the haves that have to go to the office and how to fight during that time are frontline workers and sort of the have nots, people that were able to, like myself, be in the home office um, working from there. We really kind of embedded in the requirements for us to keep a safe work environment and to keep our employees safe. Um, maybe we'll get into a little discussion about the support services that we offer to our colleagues and the requirements that that um, entailed and how we made sure that we were true to our word and the principles. Um, but perhaps our other guests want to answer their questions uh, so that it can be additive to my thinking. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Renee. And thanks for pointing out that um, the risk of creating inequalities within the company by those that are uh, able to, to work from home and, and those that are not. Um, and also the, the word empathy I think emerged very, very strongly during the pandemic. And it's a word that I've increasingly seen that an empathetic employer is an employer that is an employer of choice uh, for many, for many um, talent and, and employees. But Anjeska, let us hear from, from you and, and your experience. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to join um, our panel. Uh, I'm here uh, uh, to um, uh, to tell about um, uh, very important issues as uh, legal advisors uh, to, to many clients across uh, the world and also as a representative of the company uh, with um, uh, employees. There is no doubt that uh, workplace flexibility is um, an important tool to create better uh, conditions for uh, employee well-being um, and also to create a healthy and productive working environment. However, uh, 
as you mentioned, we should keep in mind that not everyone is able to uh, to have um, a relevant home office uh, in order to be able to to perform uh, uh, their work at uh, at home. So uh, from my perspective, it is quite important to give uh, employees, if possible, the choice to opt for uh, various models of uh, remote working. In our company in Warsaw, uh, we introduced uh, two models. Uh, it is work small, the smart model and uh, flex model, where uh, the employees can decide to work at home uh, permanently, or in the system where uh, they can partially work at home and partially in the office. Um, every time uh, they can um, uh, come to the office and and work here just to have contacts with our uh, with our colleagues and with the clients, and to work on um, on um, uh, projects together uh, with uh, with uh, their uh, colleagues. I can also say that <clears throat> uh, in the early days of pandemic, uh, many companies had to change their uh, working models, and they had to, to introduce uh, remote working in their companies. Nowadays, we can say that remote working is very often seen as benefit for, uh, for employees. And uh, many job seekers uh, ask about um, uh, uh, workplace flexibility, and it is important to, uh, to them to ask whether their potential employer uh, uh, gives uh, it priority, whether such opportunity exists in, in their companies. But again, uh, I think that it is quite important to give your employees choice to decide whether, uh, whether they can work remotely or uh, in the office. Yeah in the employer's premises. Thank you, Agnieszka. I think this is very important. I, I mentioned also earlier that uh, it is a way to, to offer this flexibility to attract and retain talent. So it's it's becoming a little bit more, as you said, as, as a benefit, uh, not an, an option. Um, but Renee, you, you mentioned a little bit about um, you have many roles that are not fitting in, in a home office and that you're exploring some, some new options. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those? So a couple of things, and I totally agree with the, the comments already made. The, um, you know, during the pandemic, I think being self-aware of what it was gonna require for employees to be able to be productive at home is a, was a critical thing, right? Because it's one thing to stay, say you're gonna be at home, but is your bandwidth strong enough? Do you have the right equipment? What is it required to have a successful and productive workday, right? So we kind of grappled with that and what the infrastructure was going to require for people to be productive. And I think similar to the comments made, we also had flex work environments. We've readapted the space um, in the offices, but also to really understand if a person was going to more permanently be in the office, uh, be at home, 70% at home, 30% in the office, let's say, how do you make that seamless transition? And, and the 30% often was becoming forums for what they were not able to do in the home office. So for example, um, we want to have team meetings, or I want to get together with my group to spar, you know, that sort of ability to brainstorm and get work done. Well, that is a difficult thing to do at home, although we've mastered Zooms and Teams and other technology, there's still something about being in a room with a whiteboard. But with the requirements until very recently with six feet distance mask, you can only have certain people in a conference room. We did capacity limits in most of our facilities. So there were capacity limits about how many people we could have in the building at any given time and many people we could have in a conference center at any given time. And we really restricted internal meetings for a period of time in the spirit of the principles, self, health and safety of our organization and business continuity. So we relied on the technological advancements as much as we could. And in the circumstances where we had to get people together, we tried to make accommodations as best as possible in a safe environment. I think 
being informed was one of the pieces that was really important. Um, and during the pandemic, we had thousands of employees join us as first time employees of Merck KGA Donnerstar Germany that had to be onboarded without ever meeting anyone in person. And they're only meeting people today, you know, two years into a role perhaps. They've really never had a physical interaction. So now the balance is between what is required to have your employees in a brick and mortar building? Who has to be there? What roles have to be there? How do you make sure that's still productive? And then what are the roles and what's the expectations of employees in today's new day and age about a remote, remote work arrangement, a hybrid work arrangement, or a person whose job requires them, a person in manufacturing who's making things, a person who's in R&D. We had some of those do hybrid, some they could do experiments at home, but a lot of them have to do that in the office because the tools and equipment they need to advance their research is you know, in that location. So I think we're still capturing the best practices. I would say one of our biggest learnings, and I'd love to hear from our colleague, is um, you, we achieve things we never thought we could do, not sitting at a workbench or being in a manufacturing plant. It's amazing what can happen when you are faced with a circumstance that you need breakthrough thinking. And we were still able to really perform, drive our business forward in all of our disciplines. Um, and now the question becomes, what makes the most sense for the combination of ensuring business continuity, but also the expectation of the employee in today's day and age? Thank you, Renee. And, and you raised a, a question that I also kind of been pondering with in terms of where, when you're not together and you have this thousand new employees that are joining your company, how, how does that actually work with team building, loyalty to the company and, and the retention rate? Or do if, if you're not meeting in person, do you have the same kind of uh, feel of belonging into a company? And maybe something you could think of and, and maybe address um, as we um, go later into the conversation. But Aneska, there's a, a related issue of parental leave and maternity leave, et cetera, that is very closely related to, to this uh, flexibility at work. Um, what role do you think the crisis has had on parental leave policies? And in, particularly in Poland, um, do you see that the landscape have changed on, on these issues? Um, the landscape uh, is changing. Uh, firstly, I can say that uh, the current uh, Polish regulations on family-related rights are quite generous, uh, providing for maternity, um, parental and paternity uh, leave, all being compensated uh, <clears throat> by maternity allowance. However, in practice, uh, as a rule, uh, women are uh, take parental leave, which means that uh, they are absent from work for uh, many weeks, uh, sometimes even years. Uh, so the question is, uh, how can we encourage, uh, facilitate uh, men, um, uh, male employees to, to take uh, parental leave? Um, I can say that um, along with other uh, European countries, uh, Poland is uh, uh, to adopt uh, work balance, um, uh, work life balance uh, directive by uh, August uh, this year. And uh, we have to um, uh, implement solutions provided by the directive, among others, that. Uh, a certain part of um, parental leave uh, cannot be transferred to uh, uh, to the other uh, parent. Uh, so we hope that it will be an additional incentive for male employees uh, to take um, parental leave. Uh, firstly, to uh, to create um, um, additional benefit for uh, kids just to uh, just to uh, have also their fathers um, or second um, 
um, parent um, uh, um, being involved in in um, uh, in their life, uh, and secondly, to strengthen uh, male uh, women position uh, in the labor market. Uh, so, uh, uh, apart from um, uh, from this incentive uh, to uh, uh, to have a certain part of parental leave, uh, which is not uh, transferable to to the other parents, uh, uh, in order to to make this incentive. Uh, uh, um, uh, really um, encourage to encourage um, uh, men to to take this this parental leave. They uh, should be um, remunerated properly. So the question is, uh, what kind of allowance they should receive just to encourage them to to uh, to take parental leave. Great. And it, it actually makes me think of um, another company, another web signatory that made a very bold move in actually giving a grant to their female employees if their husbands took paternity leave uh, so that they could retain the women. So there are many ways to, to think about it. And, and I'm very um, grateful that you, you are uh, advancing on this, Agnieszka, in, in your company. Um, and, and thinking about how, how to really kind of think outside the box and get men to, to take the, the responsibility. As you said, it's a benefit for, for the children to, to have a closer relationship with, with the father, um, in addition to helping to retain women in the, in the labor market. Mm -hmm. um, I Sir, I think that it is it is uh, a very good solution uh, because under current laws, both parents can take parental leave. Uh, but uh, it is a question of uh, of our culture and attitude. So we, uh, mm -hmm. or the majority of women, believe that uh, they should take care of of uh, of their kids, and uh, just uh, are not able, yeah, to to transfer a certain part of of uh, parental leave to, uh, uh, to 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 the father. So I think that it is quite important to. To change this attitude, to not only to encourage men, but also convince women mm -hmm. that uh, they can have a um, balance between their private and professional life, just to uh, to have a benefit for themselves and also for their families, for their kids, for their husbands, yeah, to to be involved in in their family uh, life. So uh, uh, this this uh, common uh, approach, yeah, needs to be to be changed. No, no, thanks for for bringing up this uh, need for a more holistic approach. Uh, to addressing these issues, because it's not only the lack of fathers um, not taking it on, but also mothers that are maybe afraid of being considered uh, not a good mother if, if they're leaving it to the father. So there, there are many dynamics and many issues and stereotypes involved in this that requires a more informed and holistic approach. Mm. Um. In Europe, Iceland is a very good example. How can you uh, change attitude by introducing relevant uh, uh, statutory provisions um, uh, before 2000? Uh, this means before um, uh, um, the new legislation was introduced there, uh, there were few men uh, who took advantage of parental leave. After the changes uh, were adopted, uh, the current rate is about 85%. So men decide to take a certain part of parental leave just to support their wives and to, uh, to actively participate in uh, their family uh, life. Great. Maybe just add, additive to that, Anna, and I'm so, I'm so glad you shared it, is two things. I also think the remuneration of both the female and the partner, if they are to take the paternity or maternity leave, is really important because in some places there's an allowability for that, but the monetary reward is not there, or they get only a percentage of the salary, so they can't afford it, the affordability, let's just say that. So making this benefit, I think your point is excellent making it more um, 
acceptable first, mm-hmm. right? Which is one hurdle. And the other hurdle is also making it affordable for both the spouses to take the time off as many of them are dual uh, professional relationships and you want to be supportive of each other. And then of course, the benefits of them um, taking that time. So I think we're working through that similarly. And the cultural differences, like you said, Anna, are just so tremendous. You know, in some countries, it's very acceptable. I think your point around Iceland is a good one, which is the adoption happens when the behavior and acceptance changes happen. So you get the acceptance, you get the behavior changes, and then the adoption rates go up much higher. And then I think the affordability piece is going to be another big thing. So people can take it and feel good about it. And then as an employer, you it's a win-win. Great. No, thanks also for adding that um, link to equal pay, um, which of course uh, play a very important role in the family choice of who stays at home. So it is, I mean, uh, yeah, you've gone over it and, and I, I don't want to repeat, but anything that you, Renee, that you would like to add in terms of what you are doing to encourage employees and, and particularly male employees to, to take uh, on the, the paternity leave that you're offering to them? So maybe just additive to what I just said, you know, which is kind of making that affordability equation. That's one of the things. But I think that there's also this um, understanding that has to be created within the organization, which allows for the acceptability, or let's not even call it acceptability, let's call it encouragement. I hear you're having a new child, either through adoption or biologically. I hope you're going to take a a few weeks off. You know, we need to get the managers to have that dialogue with both our female and our male employees that creates that sort of mindset shift. And I think that's what we're talking about, right? Which is a mindset shift um, to make the one make the both genders of our employee base feel like they can take it and enjoy it. Two, if they take it and enjoy it and feel fulfilled, there's tremendous benefits to their relationships, to their families. We know that, but there's tremendous benefits to the company too, because they come back motivated and feeling fulfilled that the organization allowed them Um, to take that time. The only thing I would maybe say that we're focusing on right now is something which I'm calling returnership, which is one of the, um, I'm a mom, I had four children, I took four maternity leaves, I had four great maternity leaves, I have four great kids, and I had four great returnerships, right? Partly because I had a great manager in every instance, and the manager made sure that prior to my departure, and there's something on me too, me as the individual employee, I kind of knew what I was going into. I, or my first, I didn't know anything, but took advantage of it, took the leave, and then managed my way back into the organization. This returnership thing is something I think we all have to work on a little bit, especially for first-time parents, which is how does a company help that re-immersion into the organization? And this is for both genders so that they don't feel like they've gotten behind. They don't feel that level of guilt that goes along with taking sort of that leave, that they're coming back feeling motivated, empowered, and that they enjoyed the benefit, but that they're not coming back kind of being like, where do I go? That takes something on both the returner and the company's work to returnership them. Some companies do this very well. I think companies like ourselves where we're multinationals. Uh, we have some work to do here to make sure that we're getting it right and that we are making people feel whole. And this is not just on the maternity or paternity leaves. This is also on people who do expat assignments, people who do special assignments, people who maybe take leave for sick, ailing parents, maybe somebody who takes a leave for their own health issues and health and well being post the pandemic is a big one. So I think this concept of returnership is a really critical one that at least from my perspective, having been in this role now for only about six months, is something I think we need to reorientate ourselves and say, what does it look like today? And what it, it's different for so many different dimensions. What are those dimensions? And how do we make sure we have the toolbox for people to succeed after they take well-deserved time off or time off that is necess- necessitated by illness or other things? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, great. Um, And I think it's also important that uh, the company realizes that they benefit from 
from having these happy uh, employees, but also they might have gained some new skills. As we know, as parents, we are exercising multitasking, conflict resolution, and all those kind of skill sets that we are developing when we are caring for, for others. We call them uh, parent smart companies. So uh, it's something to think about, um, but um, we are running here a little bit against time. So Agnieszka, I'd like to move a little bit into uh, your industry, the legal industry, uh, is known very much for working long hours and tight deadlines, etc. And many women have kind of left the industry because it's they can't balance and, and have this work-life balance uh, with the other responsibilities, particularly as they become mothers. So how, how can we help uh, ensure that women are staying and, and kind of remaining in, in this industry and uh, growing and, and advancing as leaders? Mm -hmm. So uh, firstly, I can confirm that it is possible to, uh, to combine uh, both uh, sphere uh, and uh, to, to have a um, uh, balance uh, between um, your professional and, and private uh, commitments. There are many examples of, of uh, uh, women uh, uh, who have um, um, leader positions in, in, uh, in many uh, sectors, including um, our our business. Uh, uh, they are uh, um, in our uh, um, company. There are many uh, women who hold senior leadership positions uh, in the board, uh, uh, who are um, uh, international group heads, uh, um, uh, who are um, uh, uh, leading offices uh, in in uh, various uh, countries. And they are at the same time mothers uh, and 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 partners. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, um, as Rene mentioned, uh, um, very important to to know uh, that you are supported by organization who offers you um, uh, various um, uh, arrangements uh, who help you to. Uh, uh, to, to have uh, 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 an appropriate balance uh, between uh, both uh, spheres. So uh, uh, all um, flexible, uh, uh, flexible uh, working hours arrangements, part-time, remote working, uh, definitely helps. And it is also uh, uh, assistance um, with uh, all um, uh, parental uh, related uh, rights and also support from uh, from other colleagues from your managers yeah to uh, uh, to help you to uh, uh, to uh, improve your uh, your experience your knowledge uh, um, and to, to have, first of all, uh, the feeling that, uh, uh, that you can be successful um, uh, in, your, in your workplace. Great. Thank you, Agnieszka. Um, before we wrap up, I have uh, two more questions. Uh, one is in relation to who is responsible for these issues within your company, uh, the issues of flexible um, uh, flexibility and remote working and uh, who's driving this and how do they go about it um, and um, how do they or how do you track um, that people the uptake of, of the policies and and if you could get shed some light on who's responsible and how do they track all of these activities whether there is an uptake or, or not uh, Renee should we start with you Originally, when it was born during this time period, it was kind of it came as a result of the issues management and crisis team that everybody had during the pandemic initially. And then it it slowly became sort of in the work stream around employee well-being, which would fell under the umbrella of human resources. And it was a shared responsibility between our total rewards team, our talent development and acquisition team. And of course, our DE&I inclusivity team. Uh, ultimately, the um, talent development and acquisition team, um, or we call a TDR, talent development and recruitment team, was the team that developed a flex work policy globally. 
the most interesting piece of this, and, and we talked a little bit about this already, is that the dynamics by country had to be very carefully looked at because by country, there are certain rules, regulations, laws. By country, there is different dynamics about the kind of work done in that country. In some countries, we had manufacturing, supply chain, you know, um, office work, so that that required something. So the way that it was done at an enterprise level was to create a flex work policy that could be adapted based on a formula that then was agreed and endorsed at a country level and then pulled through at a country level and tracked at a country level so that it could be, you know, accommodating to the regions and the areas, but in sync with the philosoph philosophical guidances of the enterprise. So it wasn't like one entity was making, allowing everyone to work from home and everybody else was making everyone go in the office, right? Because that's how you create that dissension in an organization. So I think it flowed very nicely. And then I think the last thing I would say on it is that the tracking um, we've done, um, I think pretty well. Um, and the adoption, um, you know, there has, there's energy for a certain population of people. They want to get back to the office. And there is energy by others who are like, I'm pretty comfortable with this hybrid or full-time situation. So finding the dynamic now of what a flex work policy means in today's day and age, vis-a-vis -vis what it meant 12 months ago, 18 months ago, two months ago, when we were in a very different circumstance, sort of this, um, I was reading an article today, they were calling it the great reset, not the great resignation, the great reset. What does this reset look like as it comes to the hybrid working? So we have a very systematic kind of approach to it. We're monitoring it and kind of also keeping in close sync. And that's why it's in the HR department, um, also in close uh, coordination with the executive team um, so that we're in ensuring that we don't disrupt business continuity, that we keep our employees safe, but we're also understanding the needs of the talent market today in a very competitive environment globally. Yeah, thanks, Renee. Uh, Agnieszka, anything to, uh, you'd like to add to this? <laughs> Well, I can say that uh, uh, there is um, a similar approach uh, in our um, company. It's a Leadership Alliance for Women. Uh, it is our gender balance people network. Um, its purpose is to support the gender balance at all levels by strengthening uh, the influence, leadership, and voice of women uh, within um, the firm to affect the change. Um, we, uh, we want to, first of all, to achieve, um, uh, uh, to, to have an inclusive culture in our firm where women feel enabled and empowered to be successful and to reach uh, their full potential and to be confidential, uh, confident uh, uh, in their success. Um, we have um, within the initiative, uh, we have a channel where we can share our ideas, stories, and keep in touch with uh, the colleagues from, uh, from the firm. Um, this um, platform also um, gives us uh, opportunity to, to hear stories of uh, women, of people uh, who, um, who are successful in their professional and family life, who, uh, who are a good example how to uh, achieve the balance between uh, their family and, and uh, professional uh, um, life. Um, this initiative is also uh, present in our Warsaw office. Uh, there is a great uh, group of uh, people, of female uh, employees and also um, male colleagues uh, who um, uh, meet on a regular basis. Uh, um, we, um, uh, as example, recently, um, prepared a new policy for um, parents related uh, rights uh, for our employees. Uh, our current policy provides for solutions uh, which go beyond uh, the statutory rights. Uh, uh, the solutions encourage our people to 
uh, to um, to properly combine their private life and uh, and professional life, and uh, to create uh, quality um, between men and women. This parental rights uh, um, are um, um, for all employees. This means not only for female employees, but also male employees. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Agnieszka. Uh, Renee, uh, over to you. We are kind of uh, close to wrapping up here. So over no to you. No problem. No problem. We have a number of different initiatives within the organization, some for our ethnic ERGs and some of our cultural ERGs. Uh, we have a big international um, organization, our employee resource groups. But for our women in leadership specifically, we have a WILL program, Women in Leadership, which helps to really promote, but also to create forums where women can have mentorship and or sponsorship and certain levels of the organization. Also provides for some internships, provides for conversations that are really required for us to make sure that we're addressing the right issues in the right regions of the world at the right time. So our Women in Leadership um, organization is healthy and strong and has been a really good pipeline development for us as an organization in our continued development of talent within the company. Great, thank you, Renee. And since you're on it uh, and you have the microphone, could you uh, just give us, as we wrap up, uh, a final one recommendation that you would like to give to, to participants to take away from today's discussion? You know, I, I would just say that there's a level of care that's required around the topic of inclusivity that maybe didn't exist pre-pandemic. And if we are listening with that empathetic ear, but being very true to the fact that many of us are running for-profit businesses, of course, there's non-profit businesses, which are still businesses, which we need to drive forward. How do we ensure that when a person is working within our organizations, they feel a true sense of belonging, where they can belong, can contribute, and can really um, bring their best? And I'm excited to be on this journey with Merck KGA, Darmstadt, Germany, and I feel like um, it is a good time uh, to be working uh, towards the many missions within uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at this time. Great, thank you so much, uh, Renee. Agnieszka, do you have a final recommendation? I can also say that, uh, first of all, we should listen to our people uh, to gather uh, their ideas uh, uh, in order for us to create uh, even more inclusive uh, um, work environments for uh, for for them. Um, I think that uh, irrespective of all legislative uh, measures, it is necessary to change uh, approach and uh, um, practice uh, uh, just to to help people. Uh, first of all, women to strengthen uh, their position in the labor market and to gain equality between men and women in different aspects. Thank you, Agnieszka. And I'd also like to leave the, the conversation with one recommendation. Um, it's it's a, not a very straightforward one, but basically there isn't one size fits all. Um, it is to look in how in the company uh, to see what what can work, uh, to take an intersectional approach, meaning thinking about different gender, um, race, age, um, and other factors to kind of build into uh, the response uh, that the company has to to flexibility and and um, uh, flexible arrangements. Uh, it might also, um, as we heard from the conversation, uh, depend on the industry. Is it possible to have that flexibility or do you always need to be um, in, in at the workplace? Finally, uh, one recommendation, and so I kind of a little bit too, um, is that keep in mind low income workers. Uh, they don't have as easy to, to um, work from home. They might not have the IT equipment. They might not have the childcare. 
that allows uh, for this. So we also need to think about um, everyone from different perspectives, from different income groups, age, gender, et cetera. So I would leave the conversation with that and thank Agnieszka and Renee so much for your contribution. Your expertise, as I said in the, in the beginning, uh, is amazing and you have shed some light on, on this issue. So thank you very much uh, for the conversation today. Hopefully it doesn't end here and that will continue uh, each in our organizations, but hopefully together at some point. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.